You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, stocktwits.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the optionsinsider.com. The Options Insider Radio Network is sponsored by Fidelity Investments. Fidelity's Option Trade Builder tool can help you confidently build an options trade in three simple steps. Just choose a strategy, select a contract, and then review the benefits and risks of the trade. Learn more about Option Trade Builder at fidelity.com backslash options. Options trading entails significant risk and is not appropriate for all investors. Certain complex option strategies carry additional risk. Before trading options, contact Fidelity Investments by calling 800-544-5115 to receive a copy of the characteristics and risks of standardized options. Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC, member NYSC SIPC. Join us now for the expert source for inside information on the options markets. It's time for Options Insider Radio with your host, Mark Longo. All right, everybody. That music means it's time once again for Options Insider Radio. The interview program here on the old network where we welcome on guests from throughout the world of options and derivatives and proceed to pick their brains for the benefit of you, the listener. And next up in the old hot seat here in the studio, we have a newcomer to the program and indeed to the network. He is Toby Allen, the senior partner and head of digital assets over there at Acuna Capital. Toby, welcome to the Options Insider radio program. Mark, thanks very much for having me. And uh, before we begin, I thought I should mention the views and commentaries I provide are my own and not necessarily reflective of Acuna. I could see the, cap- the compliance guy whispering in your ear uh, as we speak, <laughs> a, little, a little angel on your shoulder, uh, if you will. But, Toby, as, you, as you're, we want to do with all of our first-timers here on the old network, why don't you go ahead and give us a little bit of an overview of your background in the options and derivatives world and how you found your way over there to Acuna. Yeah, sure. Um, so I worked here in Chicago for a Dutch option market making company called uh, Optiva. Um, I traded a few different products there in, in the option space uh, at different stages, including uh, crude oil options, NASDAQ options, and uh, S&P options. Uh, that's where I met the now founders of Acuna. Uh, and when they started Acuna and gave me the opportunity to go over there and not just trade, but build a company. Um, I jumped at the opportunity uh, and spent most of my time trading S&P. Um, and then in recent years, uh, have looked at some new opportunities for uh, Acuna, including treasury options, uh, dispersion uh, in, in the single name equities, and more recently, the last sort of 12, 18 months, uh, crypto trading, um, both options and, and the Delta One space. Uh, across many different exchanges uh, here in the U.S. and overseas. So you answered my next question already, which is kind of, uh, obviously, crypto is kind of a new asset. How long have you been doing it? About Sounds like about 12 to 18 months is about the, <laughs> yeah. is about the answer. I would, I, was, I, was, I would have been surprised if you said, you know, eight years. We've been knee-deep in the early, early days oh, of, wish, of crypto. I wish yeah. we'd been think, in it eight years. I think everyone does, right? A couple a couple of thousand of those, and they were a fraction of a cent. Uh, would have been uh, not, not, not looking too shabby. Exactly. Uh, right about now. But you mentioned kind of some of the stuff you trade. Obviously, you focus mostly on crypto now. But we've had Akuna guys on before. You guys trade 
a wide variety of products. You have a wide variety of offices. For some of our, our listeners maybe aren't familiar with the firm, you guys are kind of based all over the globe. And what are kind of some of your, your primary markets? Obviously, here you mentioned, obviously, S&P and volatility and crypto. What else do you guys trade kind of around the globe? Yeah, so um, we, we started here in Chicago, focused on the CMA, and we've expanded um, from there. Uh, we have offices in Boston, uh, obviously here in Chicago, Shanghai, and more recently, Sydney, um, where we've started trading Asian markets from. Um, but we definitely consider ourselves a, a Chicago headquartered firm, and, and that's where most of our trading happens today. Let's get into it then. The reason that you're sitting in the hot seat today, Toby, is, of course, all things uh, crypto. I've lost track, quite frankly, of how many people have, have come through here in the last six months and sat right where you are, and it's just been all crypto. And prior, <laughs> prior to that, there really weren't that many. <laughs> Probably none, I think, is, a, is an easy estimate for me uh, to make. As you know, it kind of really, really got hot around Q4 of last year, you know, when we saw Bitcoin on its now much infamous run to 20000 uh, we, of course, had the big race of who was going to list the future first, CME or SIBO. CME won that dance. Uh, by the way, I'm curious, too, before we even get into the, the, me the mechanics of what you guys are trading and stuff, uh, how surprised are you guys over there? At, are you, maybe you're not surprised. I don't know. Uh, about, uh, you know, when it all launched last year, everyone thought, oh, five coins, one coin. There's going to be a clear leader in this dance of which one's going to be, and it's going to be the one coin coin. And here we are, you know, uh, nine or so months later, and it's kind of the other way around. Is that, does that surprise you guys? Uh, it's always hard to predict these things, and we obviously have to be a little bit careful because we love both exchanges the, the same amount, and we don't want to nobody listening. It's just me and you. It's just me and, I don't know if you can see it. It's just me and you here in a room, Toby. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there is product differentiation between them, in, as you point out, in the sizes. And initially, they had different tick sizes, too, which was another nuance. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, right now, CME definitely has the, the um, bulk of the market share between the two. Um, we'd love to see one of them list options and really uh, drive their futures volume with some options, if I can uh, hint at that while we're here. Uh, and maybe some Ethereum futures too in, at some stage in the future would be great. Yeah, since we're talking crypto, you mentioned Ethereum. Obviously, everybody knows Bitcoin. Uh, everyone in our audience is just champing at the bit for Bitcoin options. Uh, we're, we, we're, we've been waiting. We took a bunch of polls back in the, the heat of the frenzy back in you know, January of this year, right after the new year launch. And we were asking everybody, you know, when do you think we'll see? Bitcoin options and the majority of our audience were super optimistic, super aggressive. Oh, Q1, easily. I seemed like a comparative laggard. I said Q2. I was, I was the, you know, the pessimist in the room. And here we are, you know, going into Q4 now and uh, there's, no, there's no options in sight. Uh, but so it's, yeah, we're kind of probably in, in surprising space here for a lot of people. Uh, speaking of the space, you guys mentioned kind of what you, what you put up in crypto, but there's a lot of there's a lot of crypto stuff over there that you guys can trade. What are you, are you guys primarily doing, you know, the underlying Bitcoin? Are you guys doing a lot of, uh, you know, maybe OTC options on Bitcoin or trading the listed futures? What is your primary go-to day-to-day thing you guys are trading in the crypto space over there at Kuna? Mark, we've got a few different areas. Um, we're definitely focused on the electronic trading side of things, uh, which right now is... Um, the, the major cryptocurrency assets across uh, exchanges all around the world and providing liquidity. Uh, that said, we also have an OTC desk, which we're really committed to. Uh, we trade the, the physical currencies, the major currencies. Um, and then I guess our uh, point of difference to some of the other OTC desks is that we are uh, actively trading options um, with counterparties on, on Bitcoin and, and other crypto assets. So let's get into that because I know a lot of our audience uh, is interested in that. Uh, we get a couple of questions uh, all the time about crypto options. So I'm glad you're here because you can answer them now for me. Uh, the first one is, uh, what does the SKU look like in, uh, I can't, I've lost track of how many people, people have asked us this question of if Bitcoin options were listed, you know, what do you think the SKU would look like? And I've heard and I've seen a lot of great arguments for a lot of different things. You know, in the early run up days, everyone said it would look kind of like Apple back in the Godot days where pre earnings were all anyone wanted to do was buy calls. And so the SKU would be bid up to the calls like crazy. I've seen a lot of people say, Say it'd be more like an index where, you know, uh, the calls would be a little bit offered from applied volatility perspective. The puts would be a little bit big because they want to, they're long, they want to hedge. I've seen others say it's a smile. 
Uh, you have the data. You're putting them up OTC. What are you guys seeing? How do your OTC skew graphs shape up? Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. Initial days on the run-up when there was a lot more bullishness in the marketplace, that it was definitely a, a very hard call skew. Um, as markets have fallen and... Uh, what you've seen is is the volatility of Bitcoin come from uh, 160, even maybe 170 in some of the weekly options back then, all the way down to right now it's about 60 vol for almost flat for six months out. And as that vol's come down, you've seen a real uh, large sort of U-shape or V-shape where you've got really aggressive call and put wings where people are sort of, I don't know, suggesting that the probability distribution is really centred around the, the prices we're seeing in the market right now, that sort of 55000 to 8000 range. But then if we break either side of that, uh, the volatility is really, really expensive for uh, protection in, in both directions. So the wings get uh, pretty crazy pretty quick. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it sounds like. uh, and so it doesn't sound like then there's no real bias then to the flow right now. It's not all calls or all puts. It's kind of equidistant around the, around the center point there. Yeah, that's fair. Um, uh, we definitely, it's more you see different interests from different groups. So um, miners and uh, people who are, are sitting on large uh, asset bases, either from an ICO or something similar, they're looking to lower volatility in, in their returns and sell calls because that's good for either their holdings or, or their business. Um, and, and looking to buy puts, whereas more of the speculators are looking at, you know, volatility being cheap and looking to get some some of that great convexity you can get to the upside. Um, you know, we talk about uh, skewed payoffs a lot in, in crypto, like you can lose 100% to the downside, that's your max loss, but you can make many times that to the upside, like you saw last year. Uh, so I think a lot of people are sort of or more of the fun type speculators are looking at that upside volatility and thinking like that. You know, what's it like for someone like you? Uh, I'm curious. I probably would have a similar reaction if I, if I dove into it whole hog right now. But you, you obviously cut your teeth in quote unquote real markets, you know, things that are deep and liquid. They have subsequent execution and market makers out there. All the things you, you've come to expect, you know, from a deep and liquid and modern financial marketplace. And now you spend you, your days primarily in this new space, effectively, that's really sprung up over the last couple of years. Uh, what are your thoughts on kind of, uh, you know, what you're seeing out there? What's your initial reaction when you first had to kind of dive into these markets? Obviously, they're very fragmented. The liquidity is kind of hard to find. Hence, a lot of people calling up your OTC desk to make you guys do it for them. Uh, and, uh, you know, the execution still, we hear from a lot of people, is, is nowhere near, you know, what you can expect on the broad space. You have these weird ancillary issues to deal with, like wallets and storage and all these things. Uh, what's that been like for you to kind of migrate into that world? Um, you know, it, it is so exciting. It's uh, I've only been an option trader since late 08, uh, so I never saw too much of markets before so then. So you're a baby is what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. Um, seeing some of... Uh, experiencing crypto, I feel like, is almost like traveling back in time. Things that haven't really been present in markets because markets have become so sophisticated and liquidity is so deep and markets so tight. Crypto has really been a, a complete, you know, uh, complete difference or change from from that. And seeing like uh, all these technical strategies that you read about in textbooks. When, when I was back in university that, uh, you know, don't always hold in traditional markets, or have really strong presence in, in uh, the crypto space. And I guess more similar to currencies, there's things like really strong momentum. Um, the business operations side is probably the hardest bit of crypto right now. Um, traditional markets, you can go to your CME or CBOE account or whatever it is and, and trade so easily even you know your e-trade td ameritrade all those kinds of things it's so easy to do whatever you want in in traditional markets in in crypto um you know opening accounts and having different accounts and being able to move your assets and uh the storage solutions and security and things like that it's just all so complicated that um you've really uh got to spend a lot of time getting the processes right and um, but because there's so much involved with getting processes right, there's a lot of opportunity there that maybe isn't 
um, as straightforward in, in traditional asset classes. And you're not the first person to to, men to make that that same analogy to me. A lot of people are like you know they they compare it to the Wild West days of the early options yeah. here. You know, in, in exactly. the late seventies, early eighties here, when things uh, weren't squeezed to death from a pricing perspective yet, they weren't regulated to death, and so you had uh, not quite this anything goes area, but uh, kind of close to it, and so people. People liked that, for, especially for the trading community here. They thrived on it in terms of being able to actually trade in and out of and, and actually do some things. And it seems like that is one of the primary reasons now why that so much of that market for and the expertise for trading for crypto has has landed here and sprung up here in, in Chicago. You know, like I said, a lot of people have come through here recently. Most of them, you know, former very experienced derivatives traders uh, who have now uh, been have drunk the Kool-Aid completely when it comes to uh, to crypto. And they see they see a lot of that. They see a lot of those early days of a marketplace. And, you know, people can have questions about the viability of the underlying. And that's fine. You know, that that's that's a certainly legitimate thing to do. But you can't question that it's tradable. You know, that there is something tradable there. It moves, there's volatility, there's pricing, there's some liquidity to be found, at least in the big products. Uh, and so that's something that, you know, this ecosystem here in Chicago, which has been to a degree sitting fallow for a while now that the floors have been winding down and people have been looking for maybe the next iteration. All of a sudden, here comes crypto. <laughs> and the next thing you know, all these operations are spinning back up again. Uh, has that been kind of interesting to watch, too, like Chicago you know, the crypto movement, shall we say, really migrating maybe from uh, the West Coast tech scene to at least the trading side of crypto, very much centered here in Chicago these days. Yeah, I think a couple, couple of reasons for that. Um, uh, the, the pace of change that we've seen in, in crypto, um, the, the Chicago trading community is um, uh, often very forward thinking and at the front of technology developments and uh, market developments and and you've seen crypto change so quickly um, in in less than 12 months. Um, some of those things we were just talking about, the spreads and liquidity. I mean, it's not like a traditional asset class yet, but it's it's gone from having, you know, arbitrage opportunities of 10 to 20 percent to arbitrage opportunities of 10 to 20 basis points in in less than a year. Um, and a lot of that is probably that Chicago trading community. Squeezing it a little bit, carping yeah. maybe, shall yeah. you say, getting in, offering a better market for the end user. That's exactly. What, that's I, what it I, is. <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, Chicago's great at spotting opportunities and wanting to make the most of them. Yeah, it has been fascinating. Obviously, desks like yours putting up a lot and really kind of turning on the turning on hitting the gas on crypto in the last, you know, 12 to 18 months. A lot of other desks have done similar things and it's kind of just ramped up. It has been very fascinating to watch that that conference I went and spoke at about a month ago uh, just to see how many firms were there that were. Chicago oriented crypto startups, a lot of them with some a pretty deep bench of, you know, experienced derivatives hands at the till uh, was kind of interesting to see. And, and you know, it, it is kind of fascinating to watch this this movement uh, kind of come into Chicago. Now you have these these kind of contrasting mindsets of the Chicago derivatives trader kind of risk management guy and this this crypto you know, a fan who, you know, probably, uh, you know, is a very much a tech tech guy and also probably leans on, shall we say, the libertarian side of the space in terms of uh, regulation and things like that. And, you know, how these two mindsets come together to make a market is uh, is, is kind of fascinating uh, to me. And I think we're, we're kind of still in the early stages, I think, of that process uh, over there. Well, you guys trade a lot of products over, like you mentioned, in the crypto space. The, the other question we get a lot is when are we going to see more? <laughs> when are we going to get more, particularly for our, you know, for our purposes in the listed space? You know, you guys obviously are stepping in and providing a lot of that functionality and that liquidity in the OTC world now. So maybe you don't want to see more. Maybe you like being, uh, you like being the go-to source for a lot of this stuff. But uh, what are you hearing? What are you seeing out there in the space that maybe, who knows, Bitcoin options, uh, Ethereum, ETH, you know, Litecoin futures? What are you hearing out there in the Ether, pun intended? <laughs> um... Look, like uh, uh, we first of all, we we love seeing more listed liquidity. Um, we we're always always encouraging of that. Um, we are seeing ex some exchanges um, around the world start to uh, list non Bitcoin futures. So, CME's partner uh, Crypto Facilities is an example of that smaller exchange out of London, um, and, and they have some alternative crypto uh, asset futures that. 
that they have going. Um, we'd obviously love to see CBOE and CME um, lists uh, s some other stuff, it, whether it's options or Ethereum. Um, they're the two things that are, you know, rumored to be coming. I know CBOE is going through a big uh, technology rollover to BATS, um, so I'm not sure exactly where options and Ethereum fit in for them. Um, CME, again, not really sure, but uh, I'm sure both companies are looking at it and discussing it. Uh, hopefully, they're not scared off by the price action. Um, and, and uh, you know, there is definitely demand for in, in the space for uh, real end users to be using options to protect their, their businesses and their portfolios. How nice would it have been to have a listed put on Bitcoin over the last year, you know? I'm not going to called you up and had you make a market for me, I guess. But uh, outside of that, uh, the, the, the options, pun intended again, were, were few. Uh, you know, you're right. And kind of our conversations with, with CME and CBO have led to the same thing. You know, I actually put, you know, CME's feet to the fire a bit on that panel saying, when are we going to see some Bitcoin options? And they made it sound like there's no timeline for them. And certainly not in 2018. CBO, you're right, same thing. They've kind of been leaning on that, uh, that tech overhaul as a bit of their uh, go-to excuse. But that... They're clearly, they want an excuse. They're not in a hurry there either. So it's kind of interesting to see uh, that after the year started off hot and heavy and everyone couldn't wait to see more products, here we are getting into Q4 and everyone's uh, kind of pumping the brakes. Maybe one of the reasons to that is what you just alluded to earlier. Uh, crypto, you know, Bitcoin, not exactly where it was, uh, you know, about a year ago or so. Or maybe actually, I'll have to see where it was last in September. Maybe it is around that level. Uh, but it's certainly not, not where it was back in December of last year, which it hit that, you know, infamous 20,000 level. Has this recent sell-off, and it's kind of been vacillating around a little bit now in this, you know, 6,500 range or so. Has any of that kind of downward movement, has that maybe tamped down demand? Are you still seeing, is your phone still ringing as much for, you know, OT? TC Bitcoin options now as it was back in, you know, January through March? Um, the option space is growing uh, in that, um, you know, we, we, we don't go out there and market this to everyone. We use an ISDA framework. Um, so uh, we're, we're only dealing with sophisticated uh, investors. Um, and uh, more of those people are coming into the space. I think also people are now looking at this big, sell off from 20,000 last year and thinking, okay, we should be using options and futures more in our businesses, particularly probably on the mining side where they have really large capital expenditures for, for equipment. And uh, they're looking at, you know, two, three year business models and trying to project revenues and expenses and all of that. And a lot of that revolves around the prices. And now they're sort of realizing, hang on, we should be looking at ways where we can you know, make sure our business has longevity to it. Um, so we keep seeing more and more people uh, reach out to us and, and um, uh, look at options and, and NDFs and, and that kind of thing. You're seeing Goldman launch an NDF desk as well. Um, Susquehanna is, is either active or uh, working on becoming active. Um, so you're definitely seeing more and more institutional interest, although we haven't really seen that wall of money in the space that people were talking about so six to nine months ago. Probably a lot of that is still because of the reasons we discussed earlier, you know, that space isn't really there yet for the large institutions that want to come play. You know, if they call you up and want to do a 10,000 lot, you know, that's going to be probably kind of hard, <laughs> I would imagine, right now. And plus, you know, the, the infrastructure there to get it executed quickly, you know, all the other things you talked about, the fragmentation, a lot of that. And that's another feedback we get a lot of people who play on the institutional side of that. It's just not quite ready for prime time yet. And we need to have, that's why people want more of these listed products to come online. You know, we get more of this infrastructure going uh, with actual market makers, with actual clearing, with all these other things that can kind of backstop. You can actually get a trade done, hit a bid and see it hit your hit your sheets, and, you know, in a fraction of a second. You know, imagine imagine that in the crypto space, you know, so things like that, that the institutional space like uh, doesn't seem like that's all online. But it sounds like your phone is still ringing off the hook, even though, uh, you know, crypto, shall we say, has been on the downswing uh, of late. I wish it was ringing off the hook. It's definitely ringing, though. It's ringing. Well, there's good. always more room that's for good. it to ring, <laughs> to ring a little louder and a little more frequently. And sleep's overrated, right? There's more time yeah. in the day for trading. You don't need you don't need to sleep at night. Call well, Toby up. Yes. Call Toby up if you if he actually likes it in like the two to four a.m. time frame. That's when uh, he really appreciates uh, your call. We, we got our Sydney desk ready for you at two to four a.m. <laughs> uh, you know, we before we wrap up here, we had a lot of interesting you know conversations about crypto, but you know we, get, we don't get a lot of market makers and liquidity providers coming through here these days uh, for a lot of reasons. Quite frankly, there aren't a lot left 
to begin with. Uh, but, you know, B, there's also a lot of challenges, you know, going on in that space. You guys are a little bit unique in the fact that uh, you focus primarily on a lot of the futures options uh, kind of side of the space. So that that space hasn't seen as many of the issues of like fragmentation and squeezing that we've seen in a lot of the equity and index option space of the guys we, you know, we all that we usually talk to here. Uh, but still, I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on here we are, you know, uh, coming into the end of 2018. We've seen a lot of big firms, uh, you know, winding down uh, market making operations and particularly in the option space uh, for a lot of reasons, spreads tightening, the technology costs are overwhelming, uh, the regulatory regulatory landscape is is terrifying uh you know so the risk is going up the reward is going down i'm curious for you guys you know building out this market making firm what are your thoughts on kind of the the plight of liquidity providers here in 2018 and the fact that you know what are the odds we actually see new entrants to your space anytime really in the near future you know it's not we don't see a lot of people diving into the market making space these days anymore uh look you know very controversial question and i may well be out of my my depth Nothing here. Nothing controversial but <laughs> at all. It's just, just normal. Two guys talking in a room. Um, I, you know, it, it's we've seen very similar things in in options and futures to what you're alluding to has happened in the in the stock space. Um, it, it, I think what allowed us to compete in this space is we've been around seven years and we've kind of faced these challenges that entire seven years. We've really driven at technology. A lot of everything we do well and, and we re, uh, make rewards from or receive rewards from, we've driven back into the technology side of our, our business and trying to make sure that we're competitive tomorrow. And options you're starting to see as well, dominated by you know just a few uh, market makers. Um, and, and those market makers all have that technology piece in, in common. All of them, uh, their biggest expenditure is by a long way, technology. Um, if you look at the, um, the the people count at each of these businesses, it's dominated by technologists as opposed to traders, which is you know the complete opposite of what it was ten years ago. Yeah, you're right, and that's you know that's both good and bad for you guys. It's, it's bad because you have to you know keep up with the Joneses with those expenditures. It's good that it's a, a bit of a barrier entry you know, to your space. So it, it, I've had a lot of people on who are well-known former market makers in the space. And I would ask them, have you ever thought about getting back in? And they all laugh and say, no, you know, the, the minimum buy-in these days is somewhere around, you know, the 10 to 20 million level to get a, a decent shop up and running from a tech perspective and every connectivity, all these different venues. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not an inexpensive proposition. So right. maybe- I mean, we've showed, I guess, that it's not impossible, though. So if there are other people who want to get into it, you know, yeah, I mean, it, the, it can be done. The Acuna story is a relatively recent one, so it can be done. You're right. Maybe maybe focusing on the futures and futures options is the way to go. Maybe that's the, uh, the it keeps the connectivity costs, at least in the initial days, down a little bit. You don't have to go out to well over a dozen <laughs> exchanges in, in the early days uh, as you do on some of the uh, the equity options space. Uh, well, Toby, we kind of covered, like I said, a lot of different ground here, mostly crypto, but you guys trade a lot of other stuff. So if there's something else we forgot to mention you want to maybe uh, toss into the ring today, or maybe you want to tease us with some hints uh, of what's coming down the pike from you guys over there at Acuna. Now is the time, sir. The floor is yours. Yeah, I mean, we're, look, we're really excited about um, Acuna's foreign expansion. Um, we just talked about some of the challenges we've faced in, in getting to where we have in, in the U.S. Um, we're really excited to try and replicate that in, in overseas markets. And um, we're always looking for, for good people to, to uh, bring on to the company in, in Chicago and then in our uh, other offices. Our junior recruiting programs are uh, open right now. If there are any young guys who are interested in getting into trading and any of this sounds at all appealing... <laughs> Um, we'd, we'd love them to apply online. They can do the 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. crypto desk. Yeah. There you go. And, uh, that's a good place uh, uh, to start. But, you know, we get that question actually a lot. You know, if I want to get into uh, the market, make, take the track that I took you know, into the space, which doesn't really exist as much anymore, coming down, become a member of the exchange and all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, we get asked a lot, are there still firms out there recruiting? So I'll be sure to start sending people uh, the Akuna way. People are intrigued. They want to learn more and maybe they want to look at your career opportunities. Where should they go? What should they do? www.akunacapital.com, A-K-U-N-A, capital C-A-P-I-T-A-L.com. Everything should be there. That's an Aussie word, right? Uh, Akuna is a, it's an Aboriginal word. Is that, is that, is that, am, I, am I reading that correctly? Yeah, you've, you've uh, heard that one before, clearly. It's actually, yeah, it's the only uh, language in the world that it means anything. It means flowing water, but it's also a bay in uh, just north of Sydney in, in, back in Australia. 
Well, Toby, glad to have you guys in the studio. Finally, you guys, the Kuna guys have been beaming in for a while. Glad to have you in here and look forward to seeing how these new markets and these new products and indeed how crypto continues to grow at Acuna in the coming months. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for having me and uh, keep up the good work with the show. Great. Thank you. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. 